is your fan's toy Spindrift 1.0 tucked away in a closet somewhere because he was replaced by the vastly superior X Transbots version? Is your MM Sphinx in a drawer, tub, or on the floor because he was replaced by one of the better options out there? Do you have your final victory figures in alt mode because you just don't want to get rid of them for the rest of your life? Well, guess what? Now you can sell your Masterpiece Transformers. Just follow this simple 8 to 25 step program and you too can sell like a professional. This course is going to give you tips and tricks to selling. And always remember, one man's junk is another man's treasure. We're going to get into talking about selling Masterpiece Transformers coming up. All right, so I hope you liked that intro. I just want to do something a little bit different, have a little bit of fun with these topics. But it seems like 2024, a lot of people are selling. I'm going to give some tips. I've seen people get frustrated with selling. It's really easy, but there's a few things you need to know to navigate your way through all of this. But I'm I'm really going to be talking about selling on platforms like eBay, Macari, or any of those bigger types of platforms. I'm not so much going to talk about Facebook. I'll give a couple little things about Facebook closer to the end and one thing about taxes. And getting into this though, let's look at Spindrift here. The first thing you have to do is you gotta decide what you wanna get rid of. Do you wanna get rid of your Spindrift? Do you wanna get rid of these figures that we're gonna talk about? Now, when you think about that, you kinda gotta get into the motivation why you wanna sell. Do you wanna sell because you're getting out of the game? Do you wanna sell because you just have too many of the same character? You just want, in your mind, the best representation of each. Do you want to sell something because you're scratched up hood on your hoodlum or something like that? Do you want to sell off your more expensive and keep the cheaper ones and just have a little bit easier lifestyle? I mean, there's a lot of different factors to look into when you decide what to sell. But what I want to say the most is if you sell something off that's hard to get back and we don't see a reissue of it for whatever reason, then, then you might have trouble getting it back. You might regret it. So that's something to think about. But the number one step is always think about what you want to sell. Don't sell off something that you'll want back down the road. A side note, but Jeff Bezos is selling off more of his Amazon stock, but he'll be able to buy that back when it takes a huge dip, or if it takes a huge dip. So there's a few things to look at, and I'm using the same figures and characters as examples because they come to mind real quick about pricing anomalies. Now, if you look at hundreds of Masterpiece Transformers that were made, they're not all going to fall into all of these anomalies. They'll fall into one of these anomalies or a different anomaly. So looking at this one here, so we have the Masterpiece uh, Shockwave. The standard one, you can it seems to sell for about 50 to 70 bucks. Now, then again, there's a lot of KOs of that out there. you got to be careful with that. If you're selling KOs, put it in your title. That is going to be something we talk about here in a little bit. But if you're trying to sell a knockoff as an original, it will come back on you. But even though even though a lot of the knockoffs are better than the original, it's still people want original. And if they find out they got a knockoff, then you're going to have some problems. So just don't do that. But this anomaly here is if you have the plus version, it sells for astronomical numbers. It is just ridiculous. Even since I reported on it last time when they had shot up to three or four hundred, now they're shooting to six hundred in that range. It is astronomical for the plus version needs a reissue or a ko or something along those lines but still these anomalies aren't for every figure the average figure you sell you're going to be lucky to get a little less than you pay for it looking at the spindrift if you want to get rid of your spindrift 1.0 then you are probably only going to get about 50 bucks 35 50 bucks i want to point out that this is something that we could talk about and I think I got it down the road, but the box. The box does make a difference. I don't care what anybody says. It does make a difference. If you're selling with a box, it's a psychological thing. People just assume you take better care of your stuff because you still have the box. When you ship it, it's more protected in a way. I mean, you could bubble wrap, bubble wrap the heck out of it and it'd still be super protected. So, I mean, it's not always better just because you got the box, but it's a psychological thing. But when you're talking 35 to 48 bucks, that's not a big deal for being put out for five years, having to keep up with the box. I understand both sides of the box debate because I am reducing my box storage myself, but I want to put that out there. But Spindrift, if you're planning on getting more than 35 to 50 bucks, you're going to just be holding on to it forever. If you price it at 20, you might sell it. Is there even a market there for buying it? Not so much, but they do sell for about this price range. So a couple more things to look at here. You do want to look at 
the current what's on the market. Obviously, you want to see what's on the market. You also want to look at what's sold. So if there's 20 jabbers on the market right now and they're all selling for about 270 to 300, then maybe you price yours 250. So if you really are aggressive and you want to sell it fast, you want to undercut probably about 10%, somewhere along that line, undercut everybody else's price, you sell it faster. And generally when people are looking for this stuff, as long as it's in good condition and all of that, and then the only difference is the price, people are gonna go for the cheaper one. That's just the way it is, it's simple, basic, common sense. And more than likely, if you're selling Jabber for 250, that's less than you probably paid for it. But who knows, you might've bought it at the height of all the craziness and you might've overpaid for it also. So, I mean, there's all that to factor in. But when you go to sell, you might be taking a loss on some, you might make a profit on another, maybe you, it all comes out the wash and you break even. I also wanna point out, and this is uh, just a fact, but when you see that it's sold and shipped from China on eBay, there's a lot of shady sellers out there and there's some reputable sellers. Now, I'm gonna say, if you order from China, well, you've got Shozy Store, very reputable. There's other reputable dealers out there, but more than likely, Shozy Store is sold out of this item. So you're looking to eBay or other places. If it's shipping from China, though, there's a, a like a two-month lag on it arriving, and sometimes, sometimes it just never arrives, or they send you a trinket in the mail. Just be careful. Be aware of this. Be careful. By the way, I only found two for sale on all of eBay. One is from the U.S., and it's a uh, bids. If you want to put it in as bids, start it at uh, like 100 bucks and let it go up. That's the thing you can do. Or you could do a buy it now, like they're doing. There's one down there at the bottom right from the U.K., and that thing is 250 but then there's 30 shipping to the U.S., depending on where you're at and all that kind of stuff. But you can do bids, or you can do... I just think it makes more sense to just put your price up and you know let people make offers. All right, so accepting offers on your stuff might be a bit of a challenge. As you can see, things sell better when they've got an offer accepted. When you're looking through and scrolling through eBay, there's a, a lot of disingenuous stuff, not on purpose, but eBay itself won't show you what that actual top right Terminus Giganticus blue version went for. What did it, did it go for 800, 900? They won't tell you that. You won't know that. The other problem is if they had a starting bid of 50 and a make offer option and somebody offered a thousand, it's still gonna say it sold for 50 plus make offer. So you're not gonna know what it sold for. So there's some, getting some research on pricing is a bit of a challenge, but I do suggest go ahead and let people make offers on your item. Let people feel like they got a good deal and pass a little bit of that good deal along. But then we get into a whole different ball game when you start using the make op offer feature. So one thing I've noticed about low ballers is not so much they just want to get a good deal, but they're expecting absolute complete and total perfection for half the price, a third of the price. And even if you hook somebody up and you're thinking, you know what, I just want to get rid of stuff, clear up some space and, and I want to, and this thing, I got to steal on it when it first came out for 130, I'll hook someone up for 130 on this. And it's got a scratch that you didn't put in your details. Then they could, uh, the low ballers are the ones that always come back with some sort of nonsense. Like there's a scratch on here or uh, the box has a ding you didn't point out or something like that. So bear that in mind when people lowball you. What's lowballing you? It's 200 bucks and they offer you one 100 or 80. That's a lowball offer. If they offer you 150, that's kind of still in the range of reality of what's going on with this Cyclonus, the masterpiece. So kind of that's a normal price, but somebody offering you 80, try to lowball you and you're like, well, I'll just go ahead and accept it and just I'll take a loss on it and I'll make it up to them. I, I'm not guaranteeing this, but there's like a 50-50 chance they're coming back at you with this petty nonsense. And do you want to know why? Because they want you to partial refund them. So, I mean, there are some shady buyers, buyers out there. I'll talk a little more about that probably. Now, it's been a while since I've talked about this, and but I have talked about this in the past. Has it been transformed? That's something that you have to put in there, I suggest. Brand new, never transformed, only displayed on the shelf. And a lot of people don't believe that. A lot of people think that's a lie, that you just displayed it on the shelf and you never transformed it. But I would say it's above 60% of Transformers collectors, Masterpiece Transformers collectors, that do not transform these things. They're just very complex, and it's time consuming, and the stress of breaking it, 
it's not worth it to most collectors. So when you look at something like Jabber that has a few breakage points, possible breakage points, it's a, a, a bit complex. This is one that you might want to put in there. Never transformed, or I transformed it, nothing's broken, had no problems with it, that kind of stuff. So that's definitely something you want to put in there to you transform it. Also, to avoid problems in the future, I would suggest that you identify any little minor scratch or issue or anything that you, as you look at it as if you are the buyer of this and you're getting this and you're trying to scrutinize it to see if there's anything wrong with it. Because I guarantee you, collectors are going to do that. Collectors are going to scrutinize every aspect of it and not just give you a pass because they like you. They don't know you. They're not going to give you a pass. Now, I can tell you right now, if you're selling to a friend, uh, then you're like, hey man, it's got a scratch here and there. It's not perfect. There's almost zero chance they're going to be a jerk to you about it. But just a, a random unknown buyer out there will definitely say something. If there's a minor little scratch here or there and you didn't put it in your description. What happens if you have a problem with a buyer and a buyer says that it arrived broken or scratched up or beat up and... And generally, it's, it's these low ballers that are the ones that are going to be the problem there. So, if first off, cover your assets with your description, number one, and then always be positive. Don't use any profanity when communicating to one of these bad buyers, and always be professional, and always just have the right, genuine heart in mind. Just say, I want to make this right to you, what can I do to help you out? and figure out a way to make it work for them. But I gotta tell you, if you're not in the wrong and you didn't do anything wrong, eBay will side with you, especially if you've been on the platform a long time. It doesn't even matter if you've been selling for a long time. You've been on the platform as a buyer for 20 years, then eBay's going to side with you a little bit more than someone that just signed up last year, or something along those lines. And even sellers have rights and there's a lot of avenues you can go to. I'm not gonna get into all of that, but if, they, if they're really screwing you over, then you can open a case against them. But you'll need to call up eBay to get them to do that because that's not something I know how to do. I've never had to do it. So it's uh, just one of the things that they told me you could do when I was talking to them about some other issue. But with that, you have rights as a seller, but you always want to just be good. And one of the things that they had told me or something along the lines is if you got one deal that goes bad, just, just write it off and move on because the other hundred that go well, it's worth it in the end. And that's kind of how they look at it too, but they will support you if you didn't do anything wrong. Next, I want to talk a little bit about selling on platforms other than like Bakari and eBay. I think there's more protections on those than on Facebook because then you're just dealing through your payment processor apps, sort of like whether you use PayPal or Venmo or any of these other payments, Cash App, oh, gosh. Uh, if you're using any of those, then you have some level of protection, but not nearly as much as if you're using eBay. If you're selling on Facebook, you need to price your stuff significantly lower than eBay. And even though you are gonna be taking a hit for the payment fee and all that kind of stuff, you still need to price it lower than eBay. It is a psychological obstacle for fans and collectors to overcome the fact that they know that you're not paying the eBay fee, that they know you should sell it cheaper than eBay. And you're person to person, not just some nameless, faceless entity out there selling on eBay. So there's a big difference selling on Facebook. I mean, I joke that it feels like the only way to sell something on Facebook is to offer, I'll give you 20 bucks if you take this, because that's the way it feels a lot of the time, and you just waste all your time putting on a Facebook. But sometimes you help a collector out, you get to sell something. It occasionally works out on Facebook, but not nearly as often. It's not nearly as efficient as eBay or Macari or any of those sites out there. So I don't really recommend Facebook, but then maybe you do want to diversify your selling because of the next thing I talk about. And I didn't really want to bring this up, but I have to. I mean, I have a responsibility to my viewers to bring this up. If you sell more than 5,000 this year, and then again, they might change the rules in November for three years in a row, but it was originally going to be 600. It wasn't 600. It was, uh, uh, they left it the same two years. Now it's going to be 5,000. Will they leave it the same at the end? I don't know. I really don't know, but you'll get a form in the mail if you sell more than 5,000. Now understand eBay does some shady tactics for adding the sales tax to your form, even though you don't see it. There's a lot of shady things that I think it's kind of shady, but whatever. 
Uh, you need to look deeper into that for yourself, see how you're set up. It depends on how you're set up as a seller. There's a lot of factors that go into it. But if you get a form in the mail, then you need to put it on your tax return because you will get financially devastated, destroyed, because the interest and fees are gonna be 20, 30% once it's all added up. So just remember, if you get a form, put it on your tax return. And if you're not, I, mean, I don't wanna say don't report stuff, even if you don't get a form, I'm saying that your, your simple tax form is now a complex tax return if you get one of these forms don't hide it from the IRS. It's better to just put it out there and then list your expenses and have all of your documentation and keep it with your taxes. But I'm not a tax professional. I have somebody do my taxes. I don't do my own taxes. So I can't really advise anyone on taxes because I don't do my taxes. And that's where I stand on it. I'm just giving you advice. And my advice is claim it. So anyway, selling can be a daunting task. It is a lot of work and it's a pain in the butt and you're gonna deal with some terrible buyers out there. It's only about one and a half percent though. One and a half percent of buyers suck and should be banned from platforms, but the buyers don't get banned very easily. So remember that. Anyway, find out if, uh, let me know if this is helpful to you. Did anything, any information in here, is it helpful to you? Did I leave anything out that you think's really important? Put that in the comments below. Like and subscribe and Tiderium Hanger out.